Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Richard Allen Davis and Polly Kloss? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the non-homicide crimes, move to the timeline of the homicide, then offer my analysis. Richard Allen Davis was born in San Francisco, California on June 2, 1954. He had two older brothers and two younger sisters. His parents, Robert Davis and Evelyn Smith, were unable to regulate their intake of alcohol. The couple was involved in a number of domestic violence incidents. In addition, they mistreated Richard. For example, when Richard was three years old, he was caught playing with matches. His mother held his hands on a hot stove as punishment. At age nine, Richard's mother put him and his siblings in the care of their maternal grandmother for a couple of years. When Richard was 11, Robert and Evelyn divorced, and their children were allowed to choose who they would live with. Richard and his sisters selected their father. His brother selected their mother. Richard's father, Robert, did not care for his children very well. He did not personally supervise them. They were often in the care of babysitters, family members, and whoever his current romantic interest was at the time. Robert remarried twice, and Richard was not a fan of either stepmother. Robert had a number of mental health symptoms, including hallucinations. On at least one occasion, Robert fired a gun at the hallucinations. The hallucinations survived. Robert used to strike Richard with some regularity. On one occasion, he rammed him through an interior wall of a structure. On another occasion, Robert broke Richard's jaw. Richard started his criminal career in March 1967 when he was 12 years old. He was arrested for burglary. Later that same month, he was arrested for forgery. When he was 14, Richard's 10-year-old sister died from a viral blood infection. Richard was arrested for burglary of a home at the age of 15. His high school career concluded during his sophomore year when he dropped out. When he was 17, Richard was facing charges for stealing a motorcycle. He was given the option of joining the Army or going to a juvenile detention facility. Richard selected the former, but that didn't slow down his criminal career. In the Army, he used morphine, engaged in fights, and was absent without leave. After 13 months in the Army, he was given a general discharge. Richard was arrested for a number of offenses in Redwood City, California in 1973, including public drunkenness, resisting arrest, possession of liquor, and over 20 burglaries. He spent six months in jail. In May 1974, just five weeks after he was released, he was arrested for burglarizing a high school and went to prison for about a year. After being released, Richard was arrested for auto theft and possessing marijuana. He received probation, but it was revoked after he was arrested for burglary and grand theft. Richard was sentenced to six months to 15 years in prison. He was released in August 1976. In September of that same year, Richard kidnapped a 26-year-old woman. She managed to escape and flag down a police officer who arrested Richard. He was sent to a mental hospital but he escaped in December. He committed several more crimes, including burglary, assault, and kidnapping. The kidnapping victim managed to grab a pistol from underneath the seat of her Cadillac after Richard climbed in her vehicle. She fired at him, causing him to run away. Richard was eventually arrested after breaking into a woman's home. In June 1977, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for kidnapping and concurrent terms for other charges. He was released about five years later, in March 1982. In 1984, Richard and his girlfriend attacked a woman and forced her to withdraw money from her bank account. In 1985, Richard and his girlfriend committed a number of armed robberies, including two banks, a yogurt shop, a supermarket, and a restaurant. Richard was sentenced to 16 years in prison. He was released about eight years later, on June 27, 1993. Before moving to the timeline of the homicide, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Vessi. Vessi sneakers are my favorite for many reasons, including 
how they are lightweight, breathable, and comfortable. They are ideal for many types of outdoor activity, like hiking, going out for errands, or walking to work. Bessies are made from Dymatex, which means they stay cool in the summer and warm in colder weather. They are extremely comfortable. Bessie sneakers are a great investment. There's never a time that these sneakers need to be idle. I like to walk in a nearby park, but before I had Vessi sneakers, this was challenging because when it rains, there are puddles everywhere. Sometimes I had to walk off the path in the grass to get around some puddles, but of course, the grass was wet too. After getting back to my truck, I would have to change out of my sneakers and socks because everything was soaked. With Vessi sneakers, that problem is a thing of the past. Now I take my Vessis to the park. It doesn't matter if it's currently raining or has just rained. It doesn't matter where I walk. The shoes are 100% waterproof and can be worn every day in every season. Now when I get back to my truck, my socks are completely dry. Vessis are my go-to shoes by my door. Check them out in the link below, Vessi.com, for a pair of your Vessi shoes. Now moving to the timeline of the homicide. On October 1, 1993, a 12-year-old girl named Polly Kloss was having a slumber party at her mother's residence in Petaluma, California. Polly was in her bedroom with two of her friends, who were also 12 years old. Sometime around 10.30 p.m., Richard Davis entered the home. Polly opened her bedroom door to find Richard standing there, holding a knife. He entered the bedroom and told the girls he would not hurt them. He was only there to steal money. Richard put pillowcases over the heads of Polly's two friends, tied their hands with strips of cloth and wires from a Nintendo game system, and ordered them to count to a thousand. Richard then kidnapped Polly. The girls freed themselves after hearing a screen door close. They alerted Polly's mother, who called 911 at 11.03 p.m. At 12 a.m., now on October 2, Richard was spotted about 25 miles north of Petaluma, California. A babysitter was driving away from the residence of her employer when she saw Richard Davis and his vehicle, which was resting in a ditch next to the driveway. The babysitter called her employer, who was the homeowner, and told her that there was a scary-looking guy inside the gate on her property. The homeowner then called the police. When the police arrived, they confronted Richard. The officers immediately suspected something was wrong. Why was this guy on a private road in the middle of the night. Richard supplied them with a number of excuses to explain his presence there. For example, he claimed that he was sightseeing and he became lost. They checked into Richard's background but did not find any warrants. They had not heard about the kidnapping because at that time the information wasn't transmitted effectively from one police department to the next. Even still, the police knew that something was wrong and they really wanted to arrest Richard. They tried to convince the homeowner to place Richard under a citizen's arrest for trespassing. In order to do this, the homeowner would have to approach Richard and say the words, I arrest you. This never happened because the homeowner refused to cooperate. I guess that was a lot of work. The police ended up calling a tow truck to free Richard's vehicle. When the vehicle was pulled out of the ditch, the police searched it thoroughly. They were really trying to find any reason to place Richard under arrest. The police found an open container of beer, but that was not illegal at the time. They made Richard dump out the beer before escorting him off the property. They told him never to return. Over the next several weeks, the police desperately searched for Polly, but there was no sign of her. At the crime scene, a palm print was found on Polly's bed, and a piece of ballet leggings were recovered. At the time, Palm prints were not stored in a database, so no identification was possible. On November 28, 1993, which was almost two months after the kidnapping, the homeowner, who refused to cooperate with the police, now wanted their help. She called to report items she discovered on her property, including a pair of ballet leggings, which had been torn. The police responded and realized that the leggings matched the piece found at the crime scene. When the police investigated further, they found the report filed by the officers who had responded to Richard's vehicle being in the ditch. The palm print found at the crime scene was a match to Richard. Richard Davis was charged a few days later. He was easy to find because he was already in custody for violating parole. 
On December 4, 1993, Richard confessed to kidnapping and murder. He said that he strangled Polly. He showed the police where he buried her body. The grave was about one mile south of Cloverdale, California. Richard would not provide any more details about what happened on October 1, 1993. The police believed that he was stalking Polly for weeks prior to committing the kidnapping and murder. Richard was convicted of first-degree murder on June 18, 1996, and sentenced to death. It's unlikely that he will ever be executed because he's in California, but several prisoners have tried to speed up the process. They were not successful. Richard survived and is now in protective custody. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, the father of Polly Kloss led an initiative in California for the state to adopt a three strikes law. The idea behind this law is that criminal offenders are never to be released from prison if they commit three violent offenses. Unfortunately, the law was not written very well. It has been applied to people convicted of all types of offenses, including nonviolent felonies. Eventually, Polly's father withdrew his support from the initiative, but California voters ran with the idea and adopted the three strikes law anyway. Reportedly, people have been sent to prison for crimes like bigamy and stealing a slice of pizza. Now, in the state of California, bigamy can be charged as either a misdemeanor or a felony, but it's hard to imagine that stealing a slice of pizza would be a felony. Of course, an armed robbery would be, and maybe that's what they're talking about. But if it was simply theft of a slice of pizza, that would have to be one expensive slice of pizza to be a felony. I guess with all this inflation lately, anything's possible. Either way, I find it interesting how the original initiative became so distorted that someone who was a key player supporting it backed out. This exemplifies how ballot initiatives can take on a life of their own. Research on the effects of three strike laws across the United States has shown that the laws are ineffective in reducing recidivism. Item number two, did Richard's early experiences contribute to him becoming a killer? Richard certainly had a terrible background. He was mistreated by both of his parents and often left unsupervised. When he was young, he would frequently kill animals, like burning cats alive and cutting dogs with a knife. Several people who knew Richard thought that he was hopeless, incorrigible, and needed to be in prison for his entire life. Richard's experiences may explain his later criminal behavior, but it's worth noting that his two brothers did very well for themselves. One became a police officer and eventually a judge. The other became an employee of Lockheed and had security clearance. Item number three, was there anything that could have prevented Richard from murdering Polly? The confluence of a few circumstances contributed to this crime. Richard kept being released from prison earlier than he should have. He should not have been out in 1993. It does not appear as though the doors on Polly's house were locked and a neighbor witnessed Richard walk into Polly's house at around 10.30 p.m. on October 1, 1993. The neighbor did not call the police because they thought Richard looked normal. One of the most frightening elements of this case is how Polly was in a situation that people would normally consider very safe. She was in her house with two friends and her mother, yet she was still kidnapped and murdered. Item number four. Richard Davis was diagnosed with three different personality disorders, schizoid, antisocial, and avoidant, so one from each of the three personality disorder clusters, clusters A, B, and C. Antisocial is not a surprise here, but the schizoid and avoidant diagnoses are pretty unusual considering Richard's behavior. For example, he had a girlfriend who committed crimes with him. This is inconsistent with schizoid personality disorder. As for the avoidant diagnosis, I would like to know who the clinicians believed Richard was avoiding, because he certainly was not avoiding victims. Richard had a history of faking mental health symptoms. For example, he faked symptoms to get transferred to a mental health facility in order to escape. Perhaps this explains the unusual combination of personality traits that clinicians observed. Now moving to my final thoughts. Despite the failure of the three strike laws, it is important that violent offenders stay in prison for a long time. Punishment should not be based on a certain number of offenses. Rather, every factor should be considered each time. 
When looking at Richard's situation, it's clear that the only thing he knew how to do was commit crimes. The trajectory of his criminal career indicated that he would commit murder someday. He was becoming increasingly reckless and violent over time. Sometimes prison isn't about punishment or rehabilitation. It's simply about keeping society safe. Those are my thoughts on the case of Richard Allen Davis and Polly Kloss. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.